Hello and welcome everybody to the masterclass in, uh, of the Game of Thrones, um, a show which has just become HBO's most watched with 18.4 million and is up for 19 Emmy nominations at this year alone. We're also in the city where it's quite obvious at the end of August that winter is definitely coming. <laughs> um, before I introduce my uh, illustrious panel, I think we have a, a VT to remind any of you um, many of whom I'm sure are fans of what the show is all about. If we can uh, show that now, please. Here to discuss the show this afternoon is Mike Lombardo, the head of programming at HBO, who said in the earlier session that his budget was big even for American standards. Then we have Robert Stern, who along with Nina Gold, has had the amazing job of casting a show which has more talent in it than any other show on TV. Uh, won four Emmys. Um, and then we have John Bradley, who was still at acting school when he got the call to go and audition for the role of Samuel Tarly. He's also... Oh. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. He has been described in, the role I in a line I particularly liked as the comedic and cowardly yin to John's yang. <laughs> <laughs> That was by me. <laughs> uh, and at the end, we have Zai Bennett in his first um, public role, I think, Zai, um, as the incoming head of Sky Atlantic. Um, until June, he was the um, head of BBC Three. Um, I also just want to say a couple of housekeeping things. One is that um, there's spoiler alert on this, that we're only going to go up to the end of um, season four, which has been shown um, on Sky Atlantic here and obviously HBO in the States. So any of you book aficionados who will discuss at <laughs> length um, what really happens in the southern land of dawn can just be quiet, please. Um, and then we also would like some questions at the end. Um, we'll sort of chat first, questions at the end, but there's also, you can ask questions on the Edinburgh app, which exciting, I see that many of you already have. Um, so we'll be asking that um, as we go through as well. Um, if I can manage to balance this on my knee, because I can't see it over there. Um, so, first of all, I'm going to start with, um, with Mike. At what point, I mean, you talked earlier about, you know, how the sort of process, not the mm -hmm. balance on my knee, um, the process of um, picking up, um, you know, the scripts that come oh, yeah. through. At what point did you realise that this show that I think Ethan um, D.B. Weiss has described as Sopranos in Middle Earth, uh, did you think this could be a great hit for HBO? You know, uh, I meant what I said earlier in that <clears throat> I try not to think of hits in either a numbers or creative, critical sense. What I responded to, I, you know, and I've said this before, I am the last person who's going to be interested in a genre movie. I mean, if I see you know, a sword or sandals, I'm like, my, I sort of, my eyes glaze over it. So I read this, when I heard about this script, the script had been commissioned uh, before I had my current job, and I read a draft, and I just thought the writing was unbelievable. I was, uh, it felt very modern to me. It felt, um, you know, by the end of the final scene, when I assume everyone has seen it, when Bran falls from the tower, I just, I, I was fully engaged on every emotional level. And I thought we needed to do this. The thing that was challenging about it was I thought, can HBO do a genre show? You know, we had sort of this, uh, a little bit of an, an albatross around that we were supposed to be doing serious fare. Was this serious enough? And I thought, you know, we talked about it. I said, you know, it's just really good. And Dan and David, Dan uh, uh, Weiss and David Benioff, who are the writers and creators of the show, uh, are two of the most thoughtful writers. I mean, so when you sit with them, you just feel you're in such capable hands. These are not two men who are doing this show because they like uh, the genre. They're doing it because they have to tell the stories. I have not read the books at that point. I still have not read the books because I want to react to the scripts as they come in. Um, and uh, I had this one anecdote. I, you know, I think so much of what we bet on is passion of the writers. 
and I happened to be at the gym I infrequently go to, and I was there, and I saw Dan Weiss on a, uh, whatever, recumbent bicycle exercising, and he had this uh, paperback uh, novel he had with a pencil, and he was marking it up, and he looked very intense, and this was long after he delivered the script, and I walked up to him just to say hi, and it was a George R. R. Martin book, and I just thought, anybody that, you know, on his spare time, he wasn't preparing for anything, he just, you know, he's breathing this show. Um, so we picked it up really just on the strength of the script. Uh, I think, and, and as opposed to, the one thing we also knew, if we were gonna do this, the production level had to be as good as the writing, which is presented challenges mm. on a television budget, even an HBO television budget. But. Mm. It, that's one of the, the interesting things, it's obviously George Martin um, has only written five books. Um, you've signed up for another two series. How difficult is that when, are you sort of, you know, tempted to keep calling and saying, so come on, are you ready, can we have the next one? <laughs> uh, I think Dan and David are probably are very tempted to, I think they have those conversations. Look, I think uh, this year, the coming year, we will, you know, be, uh, w w I think they're now juggling narratively with, you know, where George is going with the books. and so. There will come a time where that will be an issue. Fortunately, we're not there yet, but it is, uh, I'm confident when, we'll figure it out. When you say juggling, you mean fighting? No, 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 juggling in the sense that they're getting to the, the, the storylines are reaching to the end of the published book works. Mm -hmm. So, you know, without knowing what the next book is going to hold. So the juggling what he can tell them about where it might be going, so they affect the right tone and, um, uh, Given that it took him six years to write one of the books, though, are you slightly worried that people will have forgotten about getting the train? He claims it? it's shortly. You know, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, um, I'm just going to be a cockeyed optimist and assume we're going to, uh, you know, as you said, we've picked it up for another two seasons. I, I firmly believe we'll, we'll, that won't be an issue. He's, um, I think, in fact, he's raised the finger any journalist who asks him, you know, about his own health. So lots of journalists say, but what happens if you die before the end? <laughs> but I can ask you, obviously, without being asked, have you insured him? What are you going to do if he dies? <laughs> um, you know, it's not something I've, not something we've thought about, uh, at least consciously. I, you know what, I, I think he's, I do think this, I think he's mapped out creatively what he right. wants to do. I think, um, and I don't know what he's shared with Dan and David, they feel confident going forward. And I think, I, I mean, I don't know if you've met George, I don't think he's dying anytime soon. He's a robust man who uh, lives life fully. So I, I, I'm gonna bet again that we'll be fine there. You sort of mentioned the cost, and obviously yep. I'll be coming to um, Cy later, but the costs of production in this were pretty high for season one, 50 to 60 million for season yep. one, and two to three times um, anything else. You know, it's interesting, it, it was uh, expensive. At the same time, the first year, it wasn't our most expensive show. Really? You know, at that point, the most, ex I don't know, I'll say this, the most expensive show first year was Luck. And um, in part because of the horses and w what Dan and David did to mitigate against the cost, and, and again, it's to their credit, they wrote every, they write every script before we go into production. Mm -hmm. So that you can cross, which we don't do on any other show, so that you can cross board the episodes to maximize production efficiencies. That saves an enormous amount of money for us. Um, they were just so, and, and again, uh, I, I don't think otherwise we could either do it on our, at our price point or even finish the production of the shows within the period necessary to get it on every year. Every year someone will say to me, that's all? Only 10? And I'm like, these guys are still working on the lat, you know, they're, yeah. they're not done yet. Um, literally the minute they're done with one season, they start writing the next because we can't start shooting right. until they've written everything. So, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it, it's expensive, um, but actually it, it is relative to other, uh, what I'll call high production value shows, pretty effective, they're, they're, they're pretty good about managing the cost on the show. 
Now, how much, I'm going to come to Robert now about casting, but how much of the budget is on the cast? Because there's so many people. <laughs> um, Who all should be earning more money, obviously. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say, you know, I think going into it, not having read the books, um, there were certain kind of leaps we all made. I, I really didn't fully appreciate going in, how this cast grew exponentially, uh, which I think best cast working in television, bar none. So, um, yeah, the budget's gone up, but I, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, all the costs have gone up. I think the appetite for visual effects has gone up, the appetite to deliver to an audience, and I feel the same way. You know, every year, people expect a certain amount of spectacle in the show. Oh. Um, so it's something they're aware of, they manage, and so the costs have gone up, but they've always gone up with our participation. How much know? have they gone up? I mean, people have mentioned, you know, the first season had that fight, um, the battle scene where it was just Peter Dinklage at the end. <laughs> Whereas by the time you got to the fight at the wall in the last season, you know, there was all singing, all dancing, amazing special effects. So how much? How much? Yeah, I don't, I, I mean, I'd be hard to say what the, I mean, I, I just, I don't know my production people, I don't know what the percentage increases have been. How much I think, does it cost now, then? How much is the cost now? Yeah, per show. Um, Somewhere between five and ten an episode. Five and ten. I'm going to say ten. this. I'm going to say this. It is our most cost-effective show in the sense of the amount of money we make on the show in terms of the foreign sales and the DVD sales. Okay. Uh, the net cost to HBO of that show costs us more to do a two-hander than it does to do that show. In terms of it, 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 it really, which is unusual for us, it almost pays for itself. Which is unusual for us because yeah. we don't normally set out trying to monetize every show. Most of our, sh you know, we don't pencil in whether I'm going to earn enough money to pay for Boardwalk Empire. Um, so there's a certain leap you take with every show. Um, and Game of Thrones has performed beyond anybody's expectations, I think, uh, in terms of internationally and uh, and domestically in terms of DVD sales. Mm -hmm. Was that going on to the casting? Because I mean, it's a really sort of an interesting show for the casting alone. Um, so we start off, you know, you have a huge number of unknowns being cast. Your most famous actor, Sean Bean, in series one, gets killed off brutally, and if you haven't read the books, completely unexpectedly at the end. How? I mean, when you're casting the show, Robert, you know, were you sort of going right? We'll just have one marquee name, and then we'll we'll sort of you know try to get as many people as possible to sort of fill in your show. How, how, what was your thinking? Well, I think we started off um, w when the pilot came, and they came to us to work on this pilot, and um, attached already was Peter Dinklage. Um, and I worked with Nina Gold, the two of us do this show together. And um, once we saw his name on it, we'd seen the station agent and were just blown away by it. Um, we thought, this is just going to be an incredible thing. You couldn't imagine that show without that actor in it. Mm. And it was there from the start, and you were sure he was going to carry on. Then, after that, I think Sean Bean was the next person that we attached. Um, and then, well, I don't know, I mean, from then on, uh, there were lots of young characters, and it was about the excitement of discovering new people who could fill those boots. All the kind of major characters in the game, the pilot were the kind of the new regulars we were going to introduce. Mm. What was the most difficult part? Was it getting the children home? I don't know. I mean, I think the kids was certainly, um, it took a lot of time. We started that really early and we did a lot of, because you start by going around kind of the, the normal avenues. There are various kind of stage schools and all of that. And I know that the director at the time was saying, we want something that somebody doesn't feel too polished or too um, trained up. So we did a lot of um, touring around schools. And we just, you know, rang heads of drama departments in girls' schools and boys' school, schools and just got out there. And we found, you know, one person in a school in Warwick. And then uh, Maisie was found in a school in Devon somewhere, I seem to believe. Not so, stage four. Yeah. Mm. And yeah. it was great. And then there was the whole thing of getting the family together, which took quite a long time as well. So we had various options, but of the kids who we found who were really excited by who were really special and then starting putting them together and working with, the, with each other and doing improvisation and all of that. It was a pretty fascinating process because we knew that they had to be good. We knew that they had to hold entire narratives of their own 
for years to come. I mean, you can never be absolutely sure that they're going to do it, but I think they've absolutely mm. delivered those kids, um, th th those axes in spades, and they're terrific. Can you both maybe talk about why this sort of the British, that so many of them are British, um, and they, ha they keep their, their regional accents, you know, you obviously Sean Bean and the start's very northern, um, as is Sam, and then you've got the sort of, you know, posh Charles dance. What, why? Why is it so British? Well, you know, when we talked about where to shoot this and, and what to do about casting in terms of, because this is a fantasy, I mean, this is, there is, it's not England, and uh, at the same time, it's certainly, uh, I did know that, honestly. Really? <laughs> um, so, but, you know, and I, but I, there are people who don't watch the show who think it's a, a piece of British history. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I want to show them Daenerys. Um, the, uh, we sh thought for a moment about shooting in Canada, which would have been a very, and I think the decision was made was, you know, number one, Northern Ireland presented opportunities for us in terms of uh, locations that were undeniable, and to lean in to an entirely British cast, other than uh, Peter, who had been cast initially, but Fr Fr Peter, who was comfortable uh, using a British accent, and I think they cast f from there. And I think the other edict we had, we didn't care about names. I mean, we knew Tyrion was a critical piece to cast. We needed uh, a dwarf who was a great actor, oh. and uh, that was the one name, we said we need Peter Dinklage to do this, and fortunately he agreed to do this. Um, uh, other than that, I think we've been fairly Yeah, I mean also you have surprised. physical extremes to cast all yes. the time. So, you know, if you're trying to cast a six foot four warrior woman um, who's a star, you're, you know, you've got yeah. a problem. Yeah. Whereas if you can open it up, then you can find really exciting yeah. people and they can step into those boots. It's thrilling to watch them develop over the over the five years. What sort of a nightmare has it been, though, with the sort of big names you do get? Because presumably, you know, with, with things changing, you know, we've had a couple of roles where they've, they've changed, so minor roles, obviously, like Dario, and um, I think Thomas was another little boy, wasn't it? I mean, how is that, does that sort of keep you up at night, going, I can't get Charles Dance to do it, and anyway, he's, you know, he's gone now, but is that difficult? I don't know, people want to do this show. Mm. As it's grown, it's become such a phenomenon. Actors right from are just the beginning. Always want to, I think, well, yeah, I think when people, when it first started, the first, first season, people just get it. Right. And actors are, really want to do it. I mean, it makes our job a lot easier. The people are dying to be at it. They have no. such great writing for them. There's such extremes they have to play. They have, you know, that writing is all about, you know, um, it's a real exploration of uh, power and desire. And... It's so actor friendly. There are not many scripts that I don't know we've come across that have that amount of the density of the verb of the. They've got speeches. I mean, it's no um, coincidence that some of the biggest theatre actors in the UK are playing significant parts in can that because there's some new ones coming up, isn't there? In the next season, can you um, can you share with us any names that we might not have we might not know will be in the yeah, next no, absolutely. So um, for, I've written them down so I don't forget everybody. Um, well, because we've had the death of Oberyn, yeah. so we move quite, uh, so there are various Dornish characters that are part of, you know, his world. We've got the king of, of that world um, is an actor, Alexander Siddig, who we're really excited about. He was in 24 and Star Trek and is a kind of really excellent theatre actor. Um, we've got a fantastic group of three girls who play what are called the Sand Snakes, who are a kind of vengeful three-headed hydra who um, kind of take on all the, the main characters. We're really thrilled. We've got um, Keisha Castle-Hughes, who's an amazing New Zealand Oscar-nominated actress to play that, to play Abara. We've got a fantastic actress called Jessica Hunwick to play the sister. And we found an amazing teenage actor um, who's living over in Rome called Rosabelle Laurenti Sellers, who we're really excited about, who's playing Tyene. Um, so those are the three girls who are doing it. Um, we've also got, I mean, one of the bigger parts that we've got, like one of the higher profile names who's been announced so far, is Jonathan Price, who's playing a significant kind of ascetic, uh, powerful, quite dark figure who will 
I'm sure, have lots to do, and we're quite excited about him. He was you know, the Bond villain in Tomorrow Never Dies. Mm -hmm. um, he was the lead in Brazil. He's one of the best theatre actors of his generation as well. Um, and we, he's just worked on the other thing we worked on called Wolf Hall, where he plays Cardinal Wolsey in that for the BBC. Right, brilliant. Now, talking about the um, acting talent, we have John Bradley here. And just before we go and talk to him about um, Samwell, who's had this amazing journey on the show, um, we've got another VT I think we can show you um, to remind you of some of his, um, of his finer moments. John, can you tell us about when your, your character goes from this sort of, you know, very cowardly um, sort of role who sort of spins off from, you know, the sort of henchman to, to John and, yeah. and becomes the physical hero, you know, you kill White Walker, you become a love interest, you know, you save Gilly and the baby. Yeah. Did you know that at the beginning, that it was going to be a role that had that sort of trajectory? I'd like to think that the audience did. Even audience, even parts of the audience that didn't, weren't familiar with the books and Sam's narrative progressing through the books. I like to think that they saw something in him and saw that, that the show seemed to be devoting quite a lot of time to him and his relationship with John. I'd like to think that early on they didn't think that he was going to stay like that forever. And his progression has been gradual, but also there's been huge milestones of his progression, like saving Gilly during the mutiny at Craster's, killing the White Walker, pretty much everything that happens in that episode nine of season four. But Sam, the kind of character that Sam is, he's always, he was always going to be the last person to acknowledge anything positive about himself. So Sam's bravery and Sam's worth is obvious to everybody, apart from him, I like to think. And it's, it's similar, that you can draw parallels between characters in Game of Thrones. I think there's a huge parallel can be drawn between Sam and Joffrey in so much as their blind spots and their ignorance about themselves is absolutely huge. If you think about Joffrey, is he refuses to acknowledge anything negative and Sam refuses to acknowledge anything positive. But I, I think the person that Sam has to win over more throughout the course of the entire series of Game of Thrones is himself. Right. And just find a place and, and find, find his worth, find what he can offer to the group. What's it been like being part of this amazing show? I mean, we talked about this incredible fan base. Do you get recognised on the street lots of times? Like what, what's the sort of... How has life changed? It, yeah, you do get recognised on the street, but the great thing about Game of Thrones is it's not a soap or it's not Big Brother. It's, it's not something that is going to kind of impinge on people's lives if they don't want it to. You're not going to read about it in the tabloids. Therefore, if people want to watch it, they will watch it. They will root it out. They will commit 10 hours a year to it. And if people do that, they're naturally going to like it. We always see people who like it watch it and people who don't like it don't. Therefore, people who come up to you in the street and talk to you and tell you how good it is, they're going to be fans of it. They're going to like it. They're going to be positive. And I think that that's only going to be a, a positive thing in anybody's life. How often does somebody in any other job get to hear what their work means to people? What's the weirdest thing, though, they've asked you? I mean... That, as I say, you sort of you only have to start sort of digging into Game of Thrones, and you can go into sort of you know late night talk boards where they're discussing all sorts of things. I mean, yeah. what do people sort of, you know, what they said that you think that's really odd? Well, there's the classic moment where somebody in London. I've told this story before, so if you've heard it before, pardon me. But um, there was a thing where a guy said, "Oh, you're in Game of Thrones," and I went, "Yeah." He said, um, "I've got a question for you." I went, okay. I, you do know that I can't speak here. He says, um, you know, why is your character still so fat? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well... <laughs> <laughs> as far as answers to that question go, A, it's because I'm still so fat. <laughs> and I just thought, do you know what, mate? I thought, this is a fantasy show. It's such a fan show. There's dragons, there's white walkers, there's people coming back from the dead. The fact that Sam's still a bit... Rotund. <laughs> don't let that be the thing that you just don't buy about this. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I think when people are, just scientifically for a second, I think when people are placed in situations with no food and exposed, I think the body does tend to hang on to fat, <laughs> naturally. So question answered. I didn't think of... <laughs> yeah, just... Yeah, look, I, I didn't think of any of that at the time. What, 
what's the nicest thing people have said, though? Probably that. <laughs> <laughs> no, because yeah. you've become such a hero now. Yeah, I, I met a guy once who said that my character um, gave him the impetus or in inspired him to ask out the girl he fancied at school. <laughs> which great was, reaction there. <laughs> which was a really, really nice thing to say because, you know, you don't realise when you're doing scenes in Belfast with people and it's quite, um, it's quite enclosed and it's quite small. You don't realise how you're affecting people's lives in that mm. way. And I think that's a, that's a brilliant legacy of the show if, if people are affected like that. Because it does deal with extremes. Physi extremes yeah. of physicality, Game of Thrones. It deals with people who are very small, people who are very fat, people who are very tall. And, and, <laughs> I, think, and I think that, that that's... And all of these characters have got to overcome these struggles and overcome things that life has thrown at them just through the look of the draw. Yeah. And I think that can be potentially really inspiring to people. Actually, we just given what we've just come up from a session saying, is TV racist? There aren't many roles in it of ethnic women, but I'm going to be picky. So obviously there are lots of women in it. There are lots of people of all shapes and sizes. Um, but there aren't many people who aren't white. Why is that? Who are you looking for, me? Well, you just Well, you know, I here. think, I think... Um, and you, Robert, actually. It's a casting thing. But. You know, I, I think people have, have uh, asked that about the show. I think, you know, Dan and David and George, first of all, there's a lot of families in the show. So, you know, you, you tend to cast families, you know, the Lannisters uh, are all blonde-headed. I mean, uh, I think it's something they are mindful of. At the same time, I think they respond to great talent for the role that's written. And, um, you know, we've never told them you must cast diverse. Uh, we trust that they cast the best actor, actress available for the role. And, uh, you know, I th uh, that's all I can say. I think they've, they've done some diverse casting in, term, in terms of color. Um, no worse, no better than a lot of other shows. But uh, look, it's something we can all do better on. As, will, it, you know, will it change in the coming season? Uh, not, I mean, if it does, it will be organic. There's certainly no edict that you must change the way you approach uh, your casting process. Um, yeah, I, I think um, I, I, I trust and support their choices are in the interest of the show. With, at the same time, with an eye of giving people opportunities, if that's the appropriate, um, mm -hmm. or to, to think outside of the box in the casting, not, not to give opportunities, but think differently. I think they try to do that. Right. Sai, there might be some people who um, you were previously advertised as being Natalie Dormer, who plays Marjorie in this show. But obviously, we're very, very pleased that um, the incoming head of Sky Lab is here. I'm the best lookalike stuff. that you could find. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, but you've just come out of um, BBC Three. I mean, these sorts of um, budgets that we're talking about, you know, how does it compare with obviously looking for a sort of BBC Three programming budget of 30 million? Um, will it be, you know, this sort of injustice where you've got these amazing, you know, American-produced shows? Sort of, how does it compare with a poor old BBC? Well, the, the, you know, Game of Thrones is is the cinema on TV, and and HBO and Sky Atlantic are very much about that, and that is that, that's a distinct difference in the marketplace. So th this, th these are huge, these are huge shows, and I think they are very different to what else we have in British TV and drama. Do you have any editorial input at all, or is it just... God, no. You just use it I've to get as many three, subscribers I, I, I as mean, you can. I've been at Sky for three weeks, so I want to take most of the credit for Game of Thrones, but <laughs> um, uh, I probably shouldn't. Uh, no, no, it's, it's an HBO show, and it's owned by its creators and its writers, and it should be, of course. It's, it's beautiful and amazing. We're, we're just very proud to have it, and aren't we delighted about our relationship with HBO. And is it effective? I mean, you know, one of the things is that with so many people watching it on box set, uh, it's become so popular that actually they're sort of come to Sky Atlantic because you can watch Game of Thrones is slightly sort of thrown away. Do you feel that or is it still really valuable? Not at all. I mean, it's the biggest show we have on Sky Atlantic by a country mile. It's absolutely huge. Uh, even when we showed it, in, you know, simulcast it live uh, with HBO, there were still hundreds of thousands of people cho choosing to do that at uh, three in the, two in the morning or whatever it was. Mm. Um, no, it's, it's massive and the, the cultural conversation is huge around it. 
Um, one of the things I want to talk about is the amount of sex and violence that's in the shows. Um, I mean, we were talking earlier that on the BBC, just some of the, you know, everyday stuff, let alone the hideous scenes that we have of sort of rape and incest and hideous death, uh, would never be allowed. How, how, does, how does sort of HBO, how do you get away with it with Game of Thrones? Uh, I don't think it's a question, it's not, definitely not a question of getting away with it. I think it's a, a question of viewer expectation and a channel like Sky Atlantic is uh, an adult channel in all the um, right meanings and good meanings of that phrase, um, uh, as HBO is. And our viewers are uh, expecting um, to be challenged and entertained and they are quite happy to accept this, um, the, you know, the violence and the sex, because it's also, it's not gratuitous, it is, the story is demanding it and it is in integral in what it, where it's, it's never going there just for its own sake. Um, one of the things we talked about is sort of in series one, the sex and violence was so great, there was that brilliant Saturday Night Live clip um, where there's a 13-year-old boy, the uh, consultant is a 13-year-old boy saying, we just need more breasts. Mm -hmm. um, that, the sort of amount of sex that I think even Amelia Clark, who plays um, Daenerys, she said, you know, she, she sort of put a stop to it and say it, it, there really was a lot of sort of nudity for, for no apparent um, editorial purpose. Has that changed? I, I've not heard Amelia say that. I, I personally, and, and I don't uh, see myself as a libertine, I, I don't think it's ever been uh, without any purpose. I think Dan and David are two very sober, uh, thoughtful men. You know, do I think when you have brothel scenes that there are, uh, did they think it would seem inappropriate to have women clothed? Yes. Do I think they like the criticism that they're, grit absolutely not. So if they're, we certainly have never given them an edict or a, a note that they need to tone down their sexual content in the show. I, I think they, look, it's a, they have books as a map which involve wars, violence, sex. Um, it's an adult service. I mean, not adult in an X rated, but in a, I think our subscribers pay a fee for uncensored shows. Mm. Um, this isn't an ad supported network. And so I think they, use the freedom of that in a fairly responsible way. So I, I, I get, you know, if your perspective, I think the character of Daenerys changed. She went from being very much a, a victim yeah. to being a woman in power. So, I mean, I don't think they made a decision uh, to tone down, I, I, again, they may have had a conversation with Amelia, I'm unaware of, I think it was about Daenerys changed. You know, she was sold into uh, wifedom slavery to a man, uh, to a tribe and a man, and emerged as a powerful queen. And I think her, you know, th that's been her journey. So, and I... Uh, where they have got into trouble recently is this last season where um, Daniel and David were seen to have changed the books. So the rape scene I'm talking about, I don't know if you really remember the, um, where Jamie and Cersei Lannister, who have obviously been having this incestuous relationship, um, they, it ends up being a scene um, in the last series where it looks like a rape. And there's quite a lot of fuss about it. And I think even the writers were quite surprised. And George Martin was surprised. I mean, so it's telling, you know, that the author of the books, you know, when you say the but intent But it was consensual. Was it was consent. Yeah. Oh, he was but, surprised by the yes, way he, it was he filmed. Yes, he disagreed with the pushback on it. He thought it was not unlike what he... You know, so I appreciate that there was some controversy and it generated a conversation about what consensual sex is and isn't. I do think that scene... Um, I, I don't... I guess I agree that it was... It was your conclusion it was taken. I don't know if you've read the books. The author of the books doesn't agree with that. But I, I think... The author of the books doesn't agree that it, it was... It was taken out of context. Okay. So, so um, and I think that's, that's telling. I think, um, look, I, I think we all, and by we all, I'm talking about people who, who are responsible for programming, have two responsibilities. To be responsible to not have sex and violence that's gratuitous and... And that's certainly not who we are. At the same time, I want to be 
don't want to be a sensor that inhibits the authentic, organic, creative process by being, uh, you know, policing how many breasts should be on a show. That feels a conversation that I don't think, my, my, my job is to be in business with responsible, creative forces. And if I'm doing that, I trust their decisions about what's appropriate for the character or not. Um, and I feel like we made the right choice with Dan and David, and they continue to try Any, to be responsible. Anything you regret? Any scene that you sort of think, eek, that went too far? Uh, you know, I'll be honest with you, my, my own, uh, and it's less as a programmer than as a person, I don't, violence, blood, you know, there comes a moment where the extra head flying does, you know, uh, cause me to flinch a bit, but I don't, honestly, I, 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 you know, I don't sit and regret that I didn't edit it. I think part of what the journey is with them is to fully embrace their vision of the, of the books. And I think the books are massively violent. Mm. And I think, uh, and I don't think fans watch that show because of the violence. I think they watch it because the writing is unbelievable, the acting is unbelievable, the production values are unbelievable. So as long as I feel like that is why people are tuning into the show mm. and that it's not a show that's trying to attract viewers with sex or violence. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to play police with Dan and David. We've had uh, lots of questions from the floor, actually. They warned me that this is unlikely to work, but I think there's so many of you asking questions that it has. And one of them, actually, is how far, um, not just how far do you stray from the books, which is what we've just talked about, but also does George R. R. Martin mind when you do? Yeah, there's nothing we've done that George is, and he's an executive producer on the show, he reads the scripts. They talk to Everyone, so every show that goes out, he'll read it and... Yes, I mean, I don't ask him personally, but he gets copies of every script. He's, he, you know, he, he stays very close to the show. Um, you know, I think he at the same time recognizes that the show is not the book, um, that there are certain, when you dramatize a scene, but he, nothing has ever been on the screen that he's surprised by. Mm. Um, and uh, to my knowledge, nothing that he's disagreed with. Uh, Someone wants to know as well, does, does he speak to the actors about how they should behave? Has there ever, ever been words come down to you, John, saying, um, there's, you know, for reasons which will come to light only from the books? Um, Have you ever had a thing with him saying, no, actually, you are going to be the hero? Well, I, th I think that David and Dan have, a, have a massive influence over that. They have a massive influence in terms of the, how the characters develop. Um, for example, there's a scene in the, in, in the first episode that I'm in, uh, the scene, the famous um, didn't know where to put it scene, and that wasn't in the original draft of the script. That was filmed a couple of months later, and that was the result of seeing how the relationship between me and Kit was developing in a kind of, in a kind of jokey relationship, and we started to trust each other very, very quickly, and we started to behave a little bit boisterously like that sometimes. So that just shows you how kind of sensitive they are to how actors are developing into their part. And I, th and I think that once you get a couple of showrunners like that who are so sensitive to that, then that, they're the people who take control of the characters then. And, and book Sam is different to show Sam. Right. But I think, I think that the very core of the character is fundamentally the same. I just think that if, if you take characters to be, uh, or individuals in general, to be a mixing desk, every single character is just a different mix of the same thing. Everybody's got the same ingredients to make a human being, spiritually, but different things get pushed up and different things get pushed down. And the only thing that may have changed between Book Sam and Show Sam is that that mix is slightly different. But all the key components are still very much in evidence. You talk to people, the, um, the panel, about how, because they're all filmed in different places, each sort of group and uh, family, as it were, becomes sort of very friendly. Is that, I mean, do you sort of, you feel very much a unit with Kit Harrington and... Definitely, yeah. You, you become a little subcast. And as I was saying before, towards the end of season four, in fact, in the very last episode of season four, when Stannis and Davos and Melisandre turn up at Castle Black all of a sudden, we were like, what the 
Fucking hell, these people doing it? You know what I mean? This is our turf. So there are people that you, that you meet very rarely or at press events and things like that, but you do feel when you do meet them that you are part of the same crew, steering the same ship in the same direction. It's a kind of a big amorphous group that, that you feel a part of, even though you're not physically close to them most of the time. Now, my, um, my screen has, in fact, disappeared, so they were right when they said that they, uh, they might disappear. Um, but one of the questions, there's something I wanted to ask you all, actually, which is, um, who's your favourite character? And who do you think should end up on the Iron Throne? <laughs> who do you want? To, I'm going to start with John, actually, because they're all thinking how does this affect the actual production. Uh, John, who, who's your favourite character? Answer, apart from, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, we have to not have Samuel. Samuel is, you can, nobody can say Samuel, apart from maybe you, John. But um, my favourite character changes all the time in the way that, you know, people, girls in the 60s used to have a different beetle every week. <laughs> My f current <laughs> favourite character is um, Lord Varys. Right. <laughs> Why? Uh, just, because, just because it's nice to see a character be so powerful in terms of his influence over people, just in terms of just his snake-like way of influencing those people around him. But he's the last person you'd ever kind of suspect of having any influence at all. He, He's so quiet and he kind of blends into the background. And I think that kind of, powerful, that kind of power is very, very dangerous. Mm. So I wouldn't like to see him on the throne. If I was going to see anybody on the throne, I'd have to toe the party line and be a bit of a coward and just say, Stannis. Stannis, not John. No, not John, because well, it, all, that, all that, that rebellion controversy, I believe that Stannis, Stannis is the person who should be rightfully on the throne. And if he should be rightfully on the throne, then he's going on the throne. In, in terms of, in <laughs> terms of, that's the thing. I we, thought you'd be the least likely to toe the party line. We don't, we don't know. Until the book, the book's finished and the whole narrative is completed, we don't know what kind of story Game of Thrones is. You know what I mean, it could be a thing about uh, good always triumphs over evil, or it could be a story of sometimes it doesn't. So until we get to the end of the book, we've no idea what kind of show we're involved in here and it's quite exhilarating how about you Zai who's your favorite character and who uh, do you think should sit on the throne uh well favorite character is uh, uh Hodor um <laughs> that's because my 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 three-year three-year-old daughter mimics me and calls my um her one-year-old brother Hodor um and who should be on the throne I know the storylines won't allow it and it's not correct to say it's going that way but Tyrion because Tyrion's brilliant Amazing. Is it fair to ask you, Robert? Oh, I can't. I don't know. Oh, I mean, I, 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 Robert, of course, has been in the show as a steward in the first <laughs> I have season. Been the King's a casting Perhaps director. That was my favourite. <laughs> no, it's difficult. Like some of these one-line, two-line parts, you can see where somebody's just nailed something. There are times that we just are so excited in our office that they have done that, you know, and just nailed it and got the tone right. And then, you know, I, I can't pick out one. Begone. Who should be on the? Uh, who should sit on there? We've spent so room. much time, Nina and I, grilling David and Dan over dinner and plying them with drinks to try and find that out and never got anywhere, so I am really in the dark. Go on, Mike, you can... Uh, you, can... you know, like John, you know, my... As a fan, my favourite character changes often. I mean, I... Uh, this past season, I sort of re-fell in love with Cersei. Uh, not because she's the nicest, but she just uh, is ferocious. <laughs> Um, although I don't think she should be on the throne. I don't know who will end up on the throne, um, but my fantasy is that it's Daenerys. I just feel, you know, she's been in training. Uh, and and uh, I want to see the dragons uh, uh, in the capital. So, but is I'm open to anything. Back, I, because my, the questions that you've all um, asked have now disappeared, if there's anyone... Uh, I think we have mics, don't we? And if there's anyone who um, has a question, can put their hand up, that'd be great. But that, back to the original question about having a writer, well, did somebody put their hand up over there? Yes, so somebody here, and also somebody there at the edge of that row, and I'll come over here as well. Is one here? Um, but that not that the fantasy of all the fans, that they want um, Jon Snow and uh, Daenerys to come together? And isn't oh, that I the didn't difficulty? Know that. Really? <laughs> isn't that the difficulty it's... for HBO? They're desperate for um, George Martin to fit with the program, aren't they? Now? So, well, 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 I wonder if he reads that. Um, <laughs> I hadn't read that. Uh, nice couple. They're nice kids. <laughs> <laughs>
Right, where's the first question over there? Hi. Oh, there it works. Hi. Hi. Um, I've heard that since you're going to be shooting a lot in Dawn for the next season, you've moved some production over to Spain, to Sevilla, to shoot that in. If that's a... Uh, and what, if, what are the challenges with shooting in a new country like that? And why, why that place? And what benefits do you think you can bring to, to Spain itself by, by turning up? I, I, I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. If that decision has been made recently, I'm not aware of it. I didn't know we were shooting anything in Spain. <laughs> uh, so if that's true, I mean, I, I, you know, I didn't know we had, uh, we had a crew going to Spain. I'm trying to think they're shooting, I'm just going to say the scenes, but I... Uh, if that's true, I don't know. Can't speak to it. Sorry. John, have you started saying, because I think almost all of your scenes have been Northern Ireland, haven't they? Have you started to say, I think Sam should be going south at some point? Just to get a bit Well, if Sam is going people. south, I, I demand a change of costume. <laughs> <laughs> Put it that way. But yeah, we, we, you don't want to be a Dothraki, then, surely. <laughs> we, we, we got to go to Iceland for a couple of years. That, well, you know, backwards and forwards, not just for a couple of years, solid. And... And that was an amazing experience. You do find with this show that, we, that they resist green screen and kind of technological jiggery pokery as much as they can. And they like to place actors in a completely immersive environment. There's no way that you can stand on top of a glacier in the middle of nowhere in Iceland and not feel a bit wrapped up in what you're doing. Mm. I think th there's just something about the difference of when you can tell that an actor's really feeling things and when they're on a green screen in, in Burbank, you know, going to nip out for a latte or something like that. <laughs> that second. is his bid to go to Spain, <laughs> yeah. next, isn't it? <laughs> or Croatia, right. <laughs> um, and there was one there, and then that person there. Oh, let's take this person here first, then. I thought there was one at the end of that key. Hi. Uh, my name is Francesca, I work at National Geographic Channel, and I have a question for you, Mike. You've talked a lot today about how the writing is obviously prob prob probably the most important thing for you when selecting you know, a series mm -hmm. to green light. So I think it's interesting that you don't want to read the books. Can you sort of elaborate on that? Yeah, I think my sense is I want to, I mean, I want to respond to the scripts as original pieces of writing uh, without any preconceptions about what the characters should be or whether they faithfully adapted the books or not. Because ultimately, the piece is going to stand on its own. I have to assume, like myself, most viewers have not read the books, may or may not, but I, I don't, and so I've decided, and I, uh, I thought long and hard about it, that I'd rather be fresh in the storytelling. Is the pacing, does it work? Uh, when does it lull? I think if you go in knowing how the story beats play out, how the character's written, I just, I, for me, I thought it would, it would impair my ability. And obviously, other people who work with me have read the books, but I just decided I'd rather respond. And then increasingly, I became a huge fan. I mean, I'm a, as much as anybody else, it's, it's one of the worst things about my job is I have to read early drafts and see early cuts of this show before they lay in effects because I love this show. So now I, I love not knowing. When I get the outlines for the next season, I love being shocked and surprised and, and uh, saddened and all of those uh, experiences. And then also just quickly, given the success of this series, have you thought now about turning more to books as sort of a source or a starting point for future projects? And if so, will you read the book? Or will you wait for someone to send you? <laughs> you can't have three I, questions. We, <laughs> so that's really we, we've tried to, I mean, Leftovers, which is premiering here, I think, this year, which premiered in the, in the States in the summer, was based on a book. I, I think, again, you know, we are so dependent on a writer coming in with a vision. If that writer sees a book, I, I think it's risky for us to acquire a book and hand it over to a writer and say, adapt this to a great series. It's just not been our route to success. We've had some books like Game of Thrones, like Leftovers, that have, I think, have been beautifully adapted. And um, we've had some books that have, we've been less successful with. Uh, and so I think, and not because one book's better than the other, I think, so we're open. I, I, I think, uh, but I certainly wouldn't give anyone a directive to go to a book. I think it's certainly easier when you have something like Game of Thrones. Not easier, there is at least for storytelling purposes, 
some general map for, for the writers to follow, although, you know, that presents its own challenges as well. But, um, so again, we respond to the, the writer coming in. Is there a question over there? Or anywhere else in the thing? In fact, sorry, someone there. Hi, I'm Lily from The Network, and um, basically, I, I've always thought the show has, I mean, times where there's been, like, stronger like plots for certain characters, but consistently it's always just been an extraordinary show. Um, are there any kind of doubts or thoughts about uh, how to kind of top each season next time, next seasons that come around every year? Yeah, you know, it's hard not to, I, I'm sure they feel that every time they go back, you know, I think uh, you, know, you can't but feel the excitement of fans. You don't want to disappoint people. People respond to, I don't know who saw this, uh, season four has aired here already. You know, you see a battle like episode nine, and you hear the response to that. So I, I, I you know, it's hard not to look at the season and go, will we deliver on, on that excitement? Um, uh, so I think there is. But, I, you know, I think uh, at the same time, you can't over-rotate to that, and you have to surprise viewers. And, and so, but yeah, I think whenever you have a successful show like that, I'm sure Dan and David are, are constantly worrying about not just their own expectations for the show, but the viewers. I mean, you're having a relationship with the viewers and they're excited, engaged, and passionate. And I think, you know, they're human. They're gonna, they're gonna, but we don't sit down when we talk to them and go, how can you make a bigger uh, battle scene this year? Or how do we top uh, Ned Stark's death? Um, I'm sure Dan and David do enough of that themselves. Any more questions from the... Great, there are two here, and just while the mic's coming. Um, also, there was a suggestion that um, George Martin always wanted it to be a series, not a film. Can you ever imagine there being a Game of Thrones film? I think that was one of the questions. Okay. Uh, well, you know, <clears throat> it's not our business to do... I mean, the HBO is, is for the small screen. I know Dan and David have spoken about a fantasy that at some point there'd be a big film experience, and I understand that. I think there's something, you know, when I see the premiere, when I go watch the premiere of uh, Thrones with a large audience, there's a collective response. The humor hits harder, the drama hits, you know, you, you, you feed on the collective response of the audience. So I understand that there's no, there are no plans now. There are no plans to end the show soon. But, you know, and I can only imagine us doing that at the very, something we think about uh, after uh, it really lived its life on HBO. Okay. Sorry, there's a person here. Is that? Actually, that was going to be my question. But oh, I sorry. Let, let there you go. Did you me. do it on there? I'm, I'm such a massive fan. I've got questions for every single one of them. So, uh, but I'll just, uh, this one's to Zai, actually, and it might be too soon for you. But obviously, uh, being in the UK, we had to, if you're not a, uh, a Sky subscriber, uh, you can either get it through Now TV or, or whatever, but it's a long, long way to get it on sort of DVD release. Are there any plans to change how, because uh, the, I think series, when series four out? In the UK? I think it's out now, isn't it? On DVD? Yeah. Is it? Mm -hmm. Season four, no. No, no, that's it. It's on iTunes. You know, generally what they do, I mean, and, uh, is they try to capitalize on momentum, the marketing momentum of a new season. So I think historically what we've done, I think we tried to get it out for the holiday season preceding the launch of the next season. It, but some of it also is the DVD uh, distributors don't have the money to remarket it in the way that they'd like to, so they try. So, you know, uh, I think hopefully we'll have it out for the holiday season. There was somebody else over there, excuse me, there. Hi, I'm Cass from The Network. Um, now, I know that there was a flashback scene in the first episode and it was taken out and there isn't really much reference to some of the history or the Mad King. And I was wondering, no one wants Game of Thrones to come to an end, but if and when, would there be a potential spin-off or prequel based on any of the history? And if there is, then I'm available for auditions. <laughs> <laughs> There's your film then, isn't it? Uh, I'm trying to think of what scene came out of the pilot. Um, I think, well, I think there was apparently 
there was reference in a, in a trailer to a flashback of um, the torture to uh, the Stark, I think, um, some of the Stark family, when it was the Mad King or something like that, like uh, someone being set on fire in a, in a suit. You know, I'm going to say that that's wrong. I mean, I'm thinking that that's never been scripted. I mean, if they, it, I'm going to say that's wrong. I don't, you know, at this point, I think it's about all about Game of Thrones. So, uh, and I'm sure Dan and David, the last thing they're thinking about right now is a prequel or a sequel, but stranger things have happened. Um, there's a question there and there, and I think that might have to be the last as we're getting towards the end of our um, allotted time. Okay, uh, hi, Radio Times. A uh, question for Zai. Oh, really? Yes, I know. <laughs> uh, uh, Sorry, Zai. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What, what, what do you miss about BBC Three? <laughs> uh, the, uh, at Sky Atlantic and with Thrones, all the sex and violence is on the screen rather than in the office. <laughs> <laughs> Will we all miss BBC Three? Oh, bless you. Um, and there's someone there. Uh, oh, hello. Hi, I'm Jake. I'm from the network. Um, I'd, I'd like pretty much everyone to answer if they could. Um, we're obviously re seeing some new sort of fantasy TV shows coming out now, aside from Game of Thrones, like Outlander, and BBC Two's recently commissioned a new drama called The Last Kingdom. Do you, would you think that Game of Thrones has kind of popped the cork on the fantasy genre, so to speak, and now it's kind of more open for television to start making other series of such a genre that's not really had as much hype as it has now, thanks to Game of Thrones? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think, you know, when we launched... Uh, Game of Thrones, there was a general, uh, there was certainly a response, particularly with an older skewing audience, that somehow you couldn't have a genre show that was high quality drama. And, you know, I remember, I don't even know if the New York Times reviewed it in its first season. Sort of, why would we review a show that has, uh, you know, magic in it? Um, and I think Game of Thrones has dispelled that. I think the notion, and I think the other thing, it's shown that on a television budget with pro proper planning, you can do effect shows. Um, so I think there have been a number of shows that are either on, have tried, will try to sort of play in that space. Um, I think, it's a, yeah, I do think it's, it's opened it up. I think it's a testament to the show and the quality of the show. And, I think there's certainly room for more if there are fans for more. Go on, there's one down here. Have I got time for just one more? They want an oddie. Doesn't matter. Go on. How many people here are fans of the show as opposed to just here because it's a. Let's see. <laughs> um, hi, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this, but I was wondering in terms of the locations, um, how long did it take to choose? the particular location, because obviously they're, they're so evocative. And you know, I mean, just as Lord of the Rings is known so well for the location and that's, how, how much of that, how long did that take? For we scouted for a very long time. I mean, I think that the, the, the uh, Northern Ireland was a result of literally global searching and they just felt both in terms of, uh, the buildings that existed there, the climate, the richness of the colors. Uh, so we, they searched for a while. And, um, you know, in a first season, we were shooting in Malta, Morocco, and um, uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, Malta became, I think, went, we went to Croatia beginning of the second season. Um, Iceland then came in later. I think the one thing that was clear, you know, and, and, and John alluded to this, it's very important to the show, and actually it's cost effective because otherwise you have to use CGI, which is expensive and I think doesn't always work. Um, they wanted to shoot in locations that felt it mirrored the actual locations as much as possible. So when we're shooting beyond the wall, we're in Iceland. We're, that's not fake snow. I mean, John is, you know, on a glacier somewhere. Um, and uh, so it, it, uh, they're very thoughtful about locations. So um, 
But I think Northern Ireland, as I said, took along. It was not the expected choice and certainly not the first sort of assumption. No, no one had shot there before. Um, uh, but it's been a good experience. Can I, I just want to ask one last question of you all then, and then I can see my thanks. Um, I want you all to say, given this sort of young, amazing cast, apart from John, um, who, and you can't include John, um, who, who, no wait, I'm going to ask you something else. Uh, <laughs> each of you say, who out of the cast can you see as a, a great star of the future? So, you know, not Charles Dance and Diana Rigg, but of this sort of young star, who do you really think they're going to be a great star? And John, I want you to say what you're going to do next. What do you want to do next? So, go on, start with you, and then you can come. Well, you know, again, I think, uh, and you spoke about this, Robert, when we cast... Don't, no, you can't say they're all marvellous. No, no, but when we cast the children initially, you really don't know, can they act? Yeah. What happens as they get older? You know, they, they, these children have so grown up. But I think, I I think, I, I think Sansa, Sansa or Arya, either of them, oh, have okay, turned Sansa into Arya. unbelievably compelling actresses. The rest of you are only allowed one. Sorry. Okay, go on. Oh, I, I didn't know those kids, the three kids, it has to be. I think they've really... Um, they're all really amazing. They're, 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 they're really, they grab their own narrative, they lead it and they drive it, and they're, all, and they're absolutely terrific. I think they're brilliant. Sai and Sandra Rangel. and Aria, absolutely. If you're going to pick one, go on. Pick you one. can cheat. Pick uh, one. Aria. Okay. John, go on. What do you want to do next? Are you worried about being typecast? Um, <laughs> Sam and Tarly. I, uh, I, think that, I think that people who think about what medium they want to channel their acting through. As a starting point, I think you're looking in the wrong direction. I think you should strive to keep telling interesting stories and play an interesting part. Whether that be on the stage or in the movies or on TV, it shouldn't really matter where it is. You can't say, I want to do a movie and I want to star in a movie in 12 months. That's just such a broad stroke. What kind of character do you want to play? And it's better to play an interesting character in <coughs> an environment that you're not necessarily planning on. Not like desperate to be a gangster. Or... Well, no, no, if it's an interesting gangster, I'm not averse if anybody's <laughs> right. Anything. But uh, I, just, I just think the secret is to just keep telling interesting stories and playing interesting parts and don't close yourself off to not doing something just because it's not a movie. Okay. On that note, I want to say thank you to everyone who's involved in the production, um, including Chris Husman. Um, I really want to thank the fabulous panel Mike Lombardo, Robert Stern, John Bradley, and Cy Bennett. Um, <laughs> And last and, not, last and not least, and they did ask me to say this, honest, um, I want to thank The Guardian for sponsoring the event. Thanks very much. <laughs>